Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I know you're busy. Uh, I wrote uh, Boss Town a few years ago, uh, pretty much as the Big Dig was uh, finished, completed. I lived through the Big Dig uh, in the South End uh, before it was the South End that you probably know. Uh, and Boston's changed a lot. Uh, and the South End was uh, a very different place. Dorchester, Roxbury, all these places that uh, are now these unrecognizable, coveted areas uh, were once something very different. And the Big Dig really changed it. Um, so there was something that I just felt uh, I had to write because I lived through those days uh, in the 80s, late 80s, the 90s, uh, working as a bike messenger um, and as a mover, uh, blue collar work. Uh, that seems to have kind of disappeared. Boston used to really tolerate screw-ups uh, very well, and I was one of the prime screw-ups uh, of the day. Uh, but you could survive in Boston uh, during those times uh, being a screw-up. Uh, and I wanted to get that down on paper uh, just to prove that uh, it existed, and, and uh, that's the way it was. So uh, I'm just going to read from the opening of the book uh, the main character of the book is a bike messenger, a job uh, that I did. And uh, the book actually has a couple of voices in it. The voice of his father who suffers from Alzheimer's and used to deal poker games, um, a roving poker game, almost like a Nathan Detroit style uh, poker game uh, that was sanctioned both by the mob and by City Hall. His father is Alzheimer's and knows things about Boston. And as the streets are being dug up, uh, secrets come up and out uh, of his head and also out of the streets uh, along with the bodies. So uh, it's told from, uh, my main character's name is Zesty Myers. Uh, there was a real Zesty Myers actually, um, which I'll hopefully tell you about later. Uh, the book is told in his voice, but then it also changes voices into uh, what his father is thinking or remembering uh, from the past in Boston. So I'm actually gonna read uh, just the opening portion of the book, the prologue and it starts out, everybody in the game thinks they're a shark. This is how I see my father circa 1990. He sits in a high back chair, a deck of bicycle playing cards nestled in the palm of his left hand, his right hand hovering over the deck like a magician summoning spirits. He's wearing a crisp white shirt unbuttoned at the collar, the sleeves folded into ruler width rectangles that sit just above the elbows framing his forearms and the, co and the coiled muscles that shift like snakes under his tan brown skin. He is smiling, my father, exposing yin-yang upper teeth separated horizontally by a scraggly fault line where the bonding was attached but had yet to discolor to match the upper portion. His cheeks are number three sandpaper, flecked with dull nickel silver only partially covering a lightning bolt scar under his bottom lip. Smile lines run from the corners of his mouth into estuaries that reach the edges of his eyes, pools of battery acid lit with a galaxy of pinprick lights surrounding the pupils. They are liars' eyes. Most of my earliest memories are poker games, my father caressing a deck of cards, the sound of chips hitting felt, darkened windows, or drawn shades in rooms dense with smoke and men who during breaks in the action would practice staring into mirrors, trying to erase the light from their own eyes. On nights when my father couldn't find someone to sit with me and my brother Zero, he would haul us to these games where we would pass the time reading whatever books and papers were lying about, or if the game was somewhere with a kitchen or bar, Zero and I would fix the men's sandwiches and drinks in exchange for tips. Most often, though, we just sat behind, always behind, our father and watched the games unfold, luck give way to skill, friendly banter wind down into pressurized silence or muttered curses. It wasn't unusual for Zero and me to appear in school directly from these marathon games, our pockets bulging with ones and fives, hair styled with palm sweat, clothes wrinkled and pungent with cigar and cigarette smoke. It was not unusual for me to wake from a deep sleep in the nurse's office 
Zero laid out beside me, his hand squeezing imaginary cards, dreams of royal flushes and quad aces dancing behind sealed lids. The Z brothers, they would call us, the narcoleptic twins, though Zero was nearly three years older. Whether this midday catatonia brought my father grief from the school administration is highly unlikely, since those he played with were often the school officials themselves, or men otherwise hardwired to the city's machinery, politicians and their cronies, ward bosses and their street corner protégés, cops, robbers, bagmen, businessmen, and thieves. Who could tell the difference? These were the men who made things happen and problems disappear, dangerous men who brokered in favors, cautiously guarded secrets that secured their positions and livelihoods, a few of which, remarkably at odds with their public personas, weighed like liens on their conscience. Men who I was to learn later had sometimes found the weight of those secrets too great to keep and would look into my father's black eyes, those liar's eyes, and find whatever it was they sought, forgiveness, understanding. In certain Central and South American countries, places where the governments rotate in and out of power, seemingly through a revolving door directly connected to hell. There existed a cadre of men and women who hire themselves out as professional hostages, stand-ins for those taken from wealthy families and held for ransom. Though their loved ones have been removed from immediate danger, the families rarely fa fail to pay the ransom demands in order to preserve the honor of their word, their family's good name. Whether the hostages are mistreated or tortured, live or die, they could care less. In their world, reputation is everything. My father operated under much the same principle, only minus the cold, hard cash. His word was bond because generally it was all we had. My father was the place secrets went to die, never to see the light of day. At least, that's what everybody thought. But then along came the big dig Boston's $20 billion central artery project, slicing through the city's divided neighborhoods, Charlestown, South Boston, Chinatown, and East Boston, the South End, tearing up the pavement, exposing the bodies everyone had figured were buried forever. What my father knew, or rather, what he remembered, as Alzheimer's crept in and rendered his past a grab bag of etch-a-sketch memories, seemed to shift as often as Boston's topography. The city and its history were turned inside out, one heaping shovel load at a time. Buildings that had stood mute witness to decades of fitful change were reduced to rubble overnight and carted off by convoys of trucks that shook the ground like mini earthquakes as they barreled towards the harbor docks. Two-way streets were choked into one-way passages, cement barriers eliminating turns. Exits and ramps were blocked and turned around and rerouted into makeshift outlets. Rotaries were halved, draining traffic back to the streets they had just escaped. Sidewalks vanished. Bridges led to nowhere. Streets disappeared completely. And as the earth rumbled, shifted, and coughed up its secrets, from every crack, hole, and crevice, the rats came out to play. So th thank you. That's, I much appreciated. That's the serious opening. Uh, Zesty Myers, the main character, is uh, quite a wise ass. Um, so you, you don't get it in that opening, um, but it, it comes out uh, as he barrels around through uh, Boston. You were actually talking about it like just before about the role, about all the music in the um, in, in the book, and I know that that's. Um, like a huge part of the book that also wasn't in the really in the intro that you, that you just described. Much right, so. ab absolutely. Um, Boston used to be uh, a huge music town, uh, a really great place uh, to see music. A lot of bands uh, came out of Boston uh, during those 1970s, 1980s. Uh, clubs seemingly popped up and burned down uh, regularly uh, under mysterious circumstances. But Boston was, uh, it, really, it was just a hotbed uh, of rock and roll. And at some point, also, the drinking age was 18, so people used to be able to go. Now, now uh, we're talking. Yeah, used to go younger. And uh, fake IDs, they didn't have any lamination or any of that fancy uh, code that uh, probably required to get into this building. Um, so, you know, I was out uh, at the age of 14, 15, getting into trouble. 
um, and going to see music. Uh, it was really a huge part of this town. Uh, my main character gets into an accident early uh, on in the book, and it, it sparks uh, music in his head. He can't turn it off, essentially. Um, Oliver Sacks actually wrote a book called Musicophilia, I believe it was, uh, which is hard to get out of my mouth. But uh, sometimes when people, uh, it's a rare uh, occurrence, but uh, people struck with lightning, uh, people with uh, massive uh, strokes, they uh, develop an obsession with music, either to play uh, an instrument or they hear music in their heads. Um, so it's actually a, a true occurrence, um, but it's very rare uh, and very obsessive. So I kind of took the opportunity uh, to, to stick in as many Boston bands as I can remember who never made it, who, you know, who I loved and, and respected, um, but just you know, never made it. Maybe one song, uh, they had Boston popularity, and, which was probably enough uh, for them uh, to, to have just that you know, kind of uh, lifestyle and attention early on, but uh, I'm sure they didn't make a career of it. And, and any questions uh, from you, please uh, hit me up with it. So. Yeah, all the music references are cool. And I, yeah. I was like frequently Googling some of the things. Like, like you said, they didn't make it, you know? Yeah. So it's cool. This is like sort of their last thing, yeah, for we, a lot of them at least. Yeah, we, we, uh, I was always very uh, jealous of, of anyone who played an instrument. Um, I always wrote, but uh, you know, who pays attention to writers? Um, I, I only wrote to get girls, it's the truth. Um, I'm ashamed and proud at the same time. Um, but it, it only had, uh, it only went so far. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then about, um, so poker is like a, one of the other main themes besides music in the book. So you, you have a good poker. I, I do have a poker history. So poker is a, a huge part of the book with uh, the Zesty's father, uh, Will Myers. So poker was the third way I made money um, in Boston. There were always poker games breaking out uh, at the moving company that I used to work at. And there were uh, games uh, often uh, if you knew the right people. And, and the money wasn't so big, but it was another way to uh, make some money across town. I love the fact uh, poker is huge. Uh, the cover of the book, there's a, you'll see the spade uh, on the cover of the book. Um, poker is throughout. Uh, the book. I love poker because it's the one place where you can sit down with somebody, lie to their face, <laughs> and they don't hate you because it's expected. You know, it's really, uh, it's just, it, it seems to be the, the great equali equalizer of lies. Um, everybody knows what everybody is doing. Um, everybody, and the beauty is everyone really does think that uh, they're a good poker player. No matter if they lose money, it's just a bad night or bad luck or bad cards. Um, it was really a pleasure to fleece people uh, based on their uh, overinflated egos, which I suffered uh, for many years because you only get good at poker uh, through being bad at poker uh, and willing to take the hits. So um, I took my hits. How long were you uh, a bike messenger for? So I was a bike messenger through uh, how many times I get hit or how, how many years? Like, <laughs> so uh, I was a bike messenger for about five or six years uh, on and off. Um, my largest client, uh, for those of you uh, who remember the Boston Phoenix newspaper, um, which before it was the Phoenix was the real paper, um, so I used to be a courier for the uh, Boston Phoenix newspaper, which was uh, a great thing because it gave me access to a lot of different uh, uh, venues and shows. Um, so for about five or six years, I was a uh, bike messenger on and off. My second biggest client was a pot dealer, um, which uh, everybody was always so happy to see me. Um, it, it was really it was great to be welcomed uh, like that. Um, it's a tough job, but I love the, the freedom of it. Um, I love being out uh, in the streets, um, making my own schedule. Um, it's a job that seemed to die off and then come back with everybody wanting everything now. Uh, there, you know, there's such a, a currency and speed uh, these days. Uh, everyone wants it. You know, they order it, they want it. Um, 
So I think that uh, the messengers are, have actually made a comeback um, in town. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that because that's like one of my favorite parts of the book is just the detail of like that job sounds really, even compared to whatever, you know, blue collar work. I mean, that job sounded insane. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was an insane job. It, it's a job that uh, paid off in the sense that you get to meet a lot of people. Um, you get to meet people also uh, really on the way up. You, um, I recall actually meeting, uh, for the most part, you get the, the lobby, the people working the lobbies, you get the secretaries or you know, the personal assistants. And uh, a year later, they're in the you know, front office. And two years later, they, they've moved up the ladder. So it was interesting to actually see the rise um, within uh, all the different corporate structures that people you know, can begin in one place. And, and if they stick with something, uh, they really uh, can move up. So it, it was a great job uh, in that sense. So that, the, the question that I've been thinking about pertains here. Uh, so Bike Messenger and uh, Card Sharp, and uh, how did you get to work at Google? So, uh, so that, I've been that, wondering that too. So uh, I never got to work at Google. Actually, I'm a, I'm a guest uh, at Google uh, and very happy to be here. I wish that was an invitation to Google. <laughs> um, but I, I actually teach uh, in the inner city uh, in New York. I teach uh, in Mount Vernon, New York. Um, so that was another thing, just uh, working with young people, getting to meet a lot of young people in the South End. Uh, started, I was one of the co-founders of the uh, Little League uh, in the South End, the, uh, the RBI League. Uh, we used to play in a park. We used to refer to it as Crack Park. Uh, because that's what we'd be cleaning up uh, just to get you know kids on the field, um, and now it's uh, they play. I believe it's Jim Rice Field uh, in the South End. It's a beautiful park. Um, it was really uh, great to uh, start there uh, and work my way up. I haven't worked my way up to Google, <laughs> so you you can only get so far. Um, so I wanted to ask like about the characters too. I mean, one of the things that. Um, stands out in the book, like there are a ton of characters. It's almost like I kind of thought of it like, you know, The Wire or like something like that, where, a different setting, but it's just like there are so many characters. And so, in, in terms of um, like coming up with these, so like the parents in particular are pretty complicated characters. Um, so, I don't know if, you, if you, you had any thoughts on like how you came up with those characters or, or any other characters that come to mind as like people you'd want to talk about. Um, I, I really wanted to honor uh, a lot of the people that uh, were in my past. Um, and I didn't ask permission. I use a lot of real names in the book and just ass assign them uh, a character. So it, it's not that I uh, made them anything near to what they really are, but I just gave them uh, the names of characters. Um, the parents as well. Um, the, uh, my main character, Zesty's, Mom uh, was a radical and a fugitive, so she was uh, involved in uh, South American, Central American politics in the book and was part of a bank robbery and disappeared into the underground. So she was based on Catherine Power, who was, uh, you know, had um, robbed a Brinks truck um, and a guard was killed, and, and she, uh, you know, is serving time. Uh, for that. So a lot of uh, political history in the book, but just a lot of the people um, in the book, I just wanted to kind of give a nod and a shout out to everybody who kind of supported me and uh, everybody, uh, you know, basically who I, who I love. Um, I grew up a little strange uh, in Boston. I actually grew up in communes uh, in Boston uh, during the, the late 70s. There were actually a few communes uh, in, in Boston, cooperative living. Uh, the Boston Food Co-op uh, was in Alston at the time. So uh, depending on who you ask, I either had 14 parents at one time uh, because you know it was a house full of grown-ups. But of course, everyone thinks that everybody else is taking care of you. So you have uh, no grown-ups uh, looking after you. So uh, I really did kind of uh, run wild uh, during my youth, uh, but I did. I wanted just to uh, shout people out and to give people a nod. Uh, I didn't realize how many characters were in the book until uh, St. Martin Press, the book's post by St. Martin's, 
uh, and they were crazy enough to give me a two book deal. So uh, the second uh, part of this of Boss Town is uh, will be out uh, next year. I believe suckers was the word you used, right? Uh, yes, suckers. Those suckers gave me a two book deal. Um, so high hopes. I think they were hedging their bets. So I understood uh, why they did it, because uh, you just never know. Um, but they, uh, when the editor gave me back something like a style sheet of notes, there were uh, uh, pages and pages of characters that I didn't realize I had placed so many people in the book. And everyone was ascribed just a one-line description. Uh, and I really did not realize that so many people uh, were in the book. And people said, this is a complex book. Um, and uh, at one point, I, I just... I mean, I patted myself on the back, but I uh, also thought that maybe I had overstepped uh, the bounds of characters. Um, so there was a fair amount of editing. Um, I learned to not write long um, for the second book. Um, I was proud of myself. This was once a 500-page book, which got weeded down to about 300, I forget, 340 pages, uh, whatever the maximum uh, attention span of, of today's reader is, I'm told, is about 80,000 words. So between uh, 80,000 to 100,000 words is uh, that sweet spot of the crime novel um, until you're uh, Ken Follett or somebody of that nature who can you know, write a paperweight uh, of a book. Um, that's what it is. So I mean I don't know if you, if you want to go into it, but so you talked about the, the mom is based off the um, Catherine Power Catherine yeah. Power and then and then the father is there any I mean just totally fictional or well I did a little sleight of hand with the father actually um, because though the main character I mean I'm I'm ashamed and proud at the in the same breath to say the main character is more or less uh, the idealized version of me you know fast talking and slick and you know carrying around. Uh, lots of money and uh, always having something to say uh, to the prettiest girls um, working those front desks. Um, but the sleight of hand with the fathers, um, I have uh, two kids, and you know they've grown up completely different uh, differently than I have. I wanted to uh, not only let them know how things were, but um, I wanted to have uh, a memory of me if uh, when it, the time comes uh, for me to go. So the father with the, um, with the teeth, the shattered front teeth, I lost my uh, front teeth uh, in a basketball game. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was a Nerf basketball game, <laughs> and it was on Christmas Eve. I took an elbow, uh, tried getting a dentist on Christmas Eve. Um, and so the teeth are mine. The scar was, uh, I got, punched as uh, my main character often gets punched, and my teeth knock through my lower lip. So uh, a lot of the description is actually, I've, I've taken it, you know, the poker playing is also me, but it's kind of the older me. So they get the younger version and the older version. So uh, I don't know if that's overly egotistical, if any writer has ever given the full range of their being in, in uh, separate characters. but. Um, that's really uh, what Probably it's based common, on. I guess I don't know. I don't. I don't know what other writers do. As a matter matter of fact, I don't know. Like I, I see people. I have a deadline. Uh, in case you're wondering about the bags under my eyes, it's it's not just the lighting, um, which is great, uh, <laughs> but it's it's just uh, I'm under deadline for the next book, and it happens to be the uh, the end of the year. Um, so I'm I'm down to you know a, a few weeks. Um, and I've lost my train of thought. What was your question? Um, well, you were talking about how you came up with the characters. And oh, sounds like you're. Oh, just <laughs> I got it. Um, so I think I think uh, that was a lead-in, basically, to like the, the writing process um, and creativity. Um, people at Google, I know, uh, don't just get hired uh, strictly that they can uh, do a straightforward job. I'm sure that creativity is something that they look for um, to be able to work um, with a lot of different people in a lot of different ways uh, under deadlines and under pressure. Um, my writing process uh, has been the same way. I actually think of it uh, as small miracles because I'm certainly not the brightest person in the room, especially when I visit Google. But um, there's a certain amount of uh, 
incubation of an idea that you, you chew it, you think about it for a long time um, before you actually sit down and present it. So I, I incubated the first book for a long time, probably you know longer than I should have. Um, it's very uh, dishonest to tell a woman you're trying to pick up in a bar that you're a writer when you haven't written anything. But uh, sometimes you just need to really incubate. Yeah, incubate. Um, is gestation the right word? A gestation period, I think. So there's a certain amount of it. So now, so that book uh, took a long time and then came out in eight months um, after being fired uh, from a teaching job, which is another story I'm not going to tell you. Um, totally uncalled for firing. And <laughs> Now that I'm under deadline, it's uh, although I've had some amount of time uh, to think about the second book, to work under deadline um, and to have creativity almost uh, to be forced to be creative is a whole nother ball game I found. Um, and really, uh, a lot of napping is involved. Uh, I don't know if you have napping pods here, but oh well, God bless. Um, Nap, napping pods are great. Um, we need them in the school that I teach in. Um, soundproof napping pods would be perfect. Um, but I, I get up every morning very early, um, sit down really without any idea of what's going to come out next and pray uh, for a miracle. And something comes out. It's not that it, it will stay in the form that it is, but from uh, one idea is born another. Um, and the pages stack up. Um, I don't know if that's a uh, reproducible formula for creativity, but it's, uh, I think everybody is different, and it's, uh, it's working for me. And it's both books um, really will have been done in two very different ways. Um, so who knows? Yeah, um, so I wanted to ask, too. So the book is very, like, just something that doesn't really come across in, in the intro. You mentioned the intro is, um, you know, more descriptive. The book is like very fast paced. It's kind of like cinematic in a way. It, it feels like, you know, I already meant, you know, it feels like it could be a, a TV show, a movie. Is that like, are you imagining it as, as that or? Well, I'm hurt that you think the opening <laughs> is slow. Um, <laughs> well, but, but, uh, well, slower. No, I mean, it's, it's a bike messenger and everything having to do with being a bike messenger is speed. So, um, when I wrote the book, I didn't consciously uh, come out to write a cinematic book. Um, you know, the movie rights and all the riches uh, that come with it were the furthest <laughs> thing from my mind. Um, but uh, it really was all about speed. I knew that, so the, the whole story takes place o over only a couple of days. Um, and I knew I, that I just wanted that it, uh, speed was, you know, the main uh, formula for that book. So it does happen quickly. It does kind of unspool. Um, I think there's also something cinematic about, you know, talking about uh, Zesty's father, William, who has Alzheimer's. I just think that, you know, our memory is so fallible that we think of things um, and remember things um, almost, I mean, we can't predict what it is that's important to us in our memories. Um, we think that we will remember people and places and, and events. And it, does, it doesn't work out. We can't pick and choose our memories. Um, so I'm, I was always fascinated with memory and story, uh, just like any family story seems to change um, with the retelling uh, every, you know, anytime you get together with somebody, uh, with the same people over and over again, the, the story morphs uh, into something else. So. Um, I, I do think that memory, film, uh, that sort of thing kind of unspools. Um, the music, too. The music uh, with the soundtrack, like a daily soundtrack. As a matter of fact, I mean, that's the thing. Everybody now provides their own daily soundtrack. Everyone's always plugging in to the headphones. And um, I, I almost wonder whether it, it's too much, uh, in a sense. Um, we have our own uh, internal soundtracks, I think, um, more having to do with thought than music. I, I wonder how much of that we're kind of cutting off uh, by constantly being plugged in, um, although it's pleasurable. I certainly run faster when I'm plugged in, uh, when, I, when I go jogging. Um, 
but I tend to be less creative if I'm actually uh, listening to music. My students, uh, they claim to uh, work better with music and to read better with music in their ears, um, but their writing doesn't certainly doesn't reflect that. So uh, I'm not sure I, I believe that. Uh, I had a question about the writing process that you were talking about a little bit before. And um, as a two-part book, do you find that since the first book seems to be highly autobiographical, did the second book turn out to be more autobiographical or less as you were going through your creative process? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so I would say um, I would say that the second book, I knew that I, I mean, they did give me a two-book deal, so I knew there was a second book coming. So there were certain things that I put in the book um, almost that I knew I would uh, write more extensively on uh, in book number two that, that would come to bear fruit. Um, one of the questions Jacob asked me, how long um, you know, was I, I a bike messenger? And you know, six or seven years. But you can only take so much, uh, such a beating for so long. Like, uh, not everyone is Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> so I knew that, I knew I had to get out. Same with the moving business. Um, I didn't want to be a broke, you know, broken down uh, man. So I knew that I had to evolve um, and get out of the business. Um, and the character uh, thinks the same way. He starts out as a bike messenger um, in the second book, um, but finds another career um, that will bring him basically into crime, you know, the uh, crime business, which is kind of like the PI business um, of Boston. So uh, as far as like being creative, um, knowing, like setting yourself up, just knowing when it's time to step away, I guess, and realize that it's time to move on to be uh, to, to the next phase of, of your life. Um, it was the same. Uh, so I think creativity sometimes can be forced. Like if you know that, uh, that the clock is ticking. Um, so I knew that the clock was certainly ticking on me in real life, uh, which was the, in, uh, the autobiographical part. I, I think it was mirrored uh, by Zesty's uh, move away from being a, a bike messenger. Um, when I met my wife, uh, I hate to say it, I met my wife at a gym at the uh, YMCA on Huntington Avenue, uh, which was a great big gay hotspot. I met my wife in like one of the biggest gay hotspots in uh, Boston. But, um, so when I met my wife, uh, she used to run on the treadmill, um, which I thought uh, used to say my wife is one of the stupidest wom women I ever met to try to run away from me on a treadmill. Um, but I just think that uh, I think that I lost my point because I'm talking about my wife. Um, back to cre oh, the, here's here's the point. I'm I'm back with you. So some people are forced to do things. So I wasn't uh, married um, when I got my wife pregnant. We weren't married. I had no plans on marrying her. And sometimes you are just forced into making these decisions um, that spur on the next chapter of your life. Uh, it ended up being the, uh, the maturing factor for me. Um, and it, it just it lights a fire under you. So I think creativity comes sometimes it's forced. And sometimes, if you have the luxury of time um, and space, then uh, that works as well. I hope I answered your question. Uh, I know you know way more about me than you probably should, but uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Thanks. Uh, since this book seems to be a bit about pacing and speed, uh, as someone who rode a bicycle around Boston a lot in the 70s, oh, nice. okay, without a helmet. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, me too. We, cool. Well, mm -hmm. I didn't know what a bike lane was, okay? Yeah. Uh, things have changed, and I, I, I left for 30 years when I came back. And, and the pace has changed on bicycles. You know, now there's hundreds of them, and they all go at, you know, sort of a pace. Have you noticed that? Is that part of the, 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 the book, the... The, the fact that, 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 that pacing can change, not only in your life, but clearly in bias. And also, when was the first time that you saw the words stylish and south end in the same sentence? Hmm, <laughs> uh, that, that's good. Um, well, certainly the, the pace has picked up. I mean, the pace of everything has picked up, um, really, in, in all our lives, I think. Um, 
So yeah, bike lanes really confuses everybody, uh, I think. Uh, I'm, I was never a gearhead. Like, I, I could hardly you know, fix a flat tire. Uh, I just knew that uh, getting on a bike was the way to get around this city, uh, certainly. Um, but I mean, when I was in the South End, I remember um, taking the Greyhound bus used to be, I think on St. James, if I'm not uh, mistaken, it used to be uh, the bus depot. And I remember that the buses from New York, where my parents are from, from uh, Brighton Beach, uh, Brooklyn. So I would take the Greyhound bus, and, and it would come in off of 93 and then cut through the South End. And I remember coming through the South End. And there literally would be, and, and the orange line was still up, and it was dark, and the, and the streets were just uh, the Pine Street Inn. It would go right past the Pine Street Inn. Uh, homeless people, it, very dark. The sun never seemed to shine in that area. There'd be a car burning on the side of the road. I mean, this was Boston in the 1970s. This is the Bronx and New York in the 1970s, too. Um, so. Uh, if you want to call it a slow burn, uh, certainly. So back then, yeah, the South End was not uh, even on anybody's radar. J.J. Uh, Foley's is a bar that uh, I would pass, and I, I believe they're still uh, in existence um, in, in the South End. Everything has changed with Boston. Um, it's, it's amazing. The, the borders are gone. Um, the way that the neighborhoods were balkanized, practically, you know, that you could, they were just such um, unique and dangerous places to be. You needed to know where you were at all times. Um, and even within uh, their own ethnic kind of uh, groupings, like the, the, the Southie Irish would kick ass on the Charlestown. Irish, if they if they cross the borders, and you could tell that you know if you got the Southie dot or not, the little tattoo that they would have uh, between the you know the thumb, that little uh, area. The city was dangerous. Um, it was wonderfully dangerous um, because it, it was it was exciting uh, back then. You knew you were uh, in a place where you can literally go a half a mile and see something completely different, see a whole different way of life and a, a different kind of neighborhood vibe. Um, so you, uh, you probably remember um, that you, know, you had to know where you were going. You had to know uh, where it was that you should be. Uh, and uh, it was good to travel in numbers sometimes. So I have another question for you. Yep. So you've, you're, there's clearly a fair bit of nostalgia in this book uh, for the Boston that was. And I, I arrived in Boston in 1990 and have been bicycling here uh, for the last, well, 20 some years. Um, and, and, and it's been marvelous to watch the transformation and the big dig in particular that went from this absolute chaos to something that, honest to God, works. I mean, I can get to the airport in 15 minutes, which is fantastic. Um, so my question is, which Boston would you rather live in? Uh, that's a really, really great question. It, it, I think I'm going to take the question and say, which Boston can I afford to live in? Um, so it is. It, it, it's a heavy dose of nostalgia uh, with the book, with the music, um, with the city itself. Um, I didn't realize it, but you know, when reviews started coming in from the book, uh, they all spoke about Boston as being a character that, you know, Abramowitz nailed Boston. And I, I wasn't trying to nail Boston. I was trying to be true to, you know, uh, how I viewed the city and how I saw it uh, back then. It, it, that's a really tough question because every time I, I live in New York um, now and every time I come back to Boston, I want to stay in Boston. There are certain places that feel like home. But um, I don't know if I fit in anymore, because I don't know if I've kind of given up. Uh, I, I can't give up the past in some ways. Every street I, I go on, it's, uh, and my, it drives my kids crazy. Uh, I shouldn't be old enough to say, this used to be, and I remember when. And, but, but yet, I, I can't shut myself up, because the city has changed that much. The city is beautiful. This area used to be kind of a barren, you know. I mean, if I were to dump a body in Boston, 
you know, Boston slash Cambridge, this might be, the, yeah, hypothetical. <laughs> this used to be great. There was nobody here. There was nobody. This was just a, you know, a pass through to, to either get to, you know, Beacon Hill and the Charles Street or, or there was nothing here. There was legal seafood where I bartended, by the way. Um, uh, it was just kind of a, a pass through. So, so I'd love to come back to Boston. I'd, I'd love to, uh, I'd love Boss Town to be, you know, a film. I mean, that's certainly uh, the goal. Um, unless you're about to buy 10,000 books, um, that's the only way I can come uh, back to Boston and afford it. But there, um, yeah, I, I have a great nostalgia uh, for it. I'm going to be a terrible old man because uh, it, it's just <laughs> it's going to be endless. Um, that's a great question. I really appreciate. Uh, Appreciate everybody coming out uh, here. There's uh, a great feeling uh, for an author when, when people come by and, and listen and uh, just take a little piece uh, with you. So thank you. Thank you for coming here. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks.